that we sent out. He's uh, coming back from the IMB to report on what's going on over there in East Asia. A lot has been going on. So we want to support him and pray for him and um, you know, uh, be the, the uh, steward that we need to be for his ministry, he and his wife. They're both coming. Uh, and the last Sunday, we'll meet, be meeting in the big sanctuary. And that spe- Sunday is very special. We will at last have our relocation celebration. <laughs> We've moved to this location back in the, first, uh, the last week of January this year. And as you know, we couldn't have in-person service, but we're just recently trying this. And so we'll have a celebration. Uh, so you're welcome to come at 11.30. We'll do it together with everybody, all the kids and youth. And um, right now, just to help you understand the safety measures right now, in San Mateo County that we're in, uh, you can have up to uh, 50% of the capacity and, uh, or, or 200 or whichever less people. And uh, we can have up to 100 people in the sanctuary. So uh, I think it'll fit us. If we have more, we'll have an overflow room, uh, but uh, I think it'll fit us with all the kids and uh, adults and EM and Kim and whatnot. So it'll be a celebration, and we will thank our Lord for his goodness, his faithfulness throughout this uh, difficult time that we've all been through. And thank you for your support and your brotherly, sisterly love in Christ. Uh, One more announcement um, is... um, our Bible study time, we are going to push it a little bit back, right? Uh, it, it's 11.30, but uh, considering the hybrid situation, uh, some of us has to go home and <laughs> get back online. So uh, I think 11.45 is the best time for, for you to meet. So uh, that change uh, should be made. Okay. And uh, I think that's it for today. Unless you have anything to say. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So uh, Pastor David here is a children's pastor uh, <laughs> behind the scene. He's looking for volunteers, teachers to help out with their children. And I think the youth pastor, Pastor June, is here too. He's also wanted to say the same thing. You need teachers, right? <laughs> As we're starting to gather more, we need more help. So thank you for um, supporting the ministry and helping us. Let's go into the Word of God this morning. We will be reading from the book of Romans, chapter 8. I'm so excited to share this message with you that God has put in our hearts. Romans chapter 8, and we're, we've been reading the book of Romans together this spring. We've been calling the series uh, Strong in the Gospel Together. And so truly it's about the gospel, and it's truly about being together in the gospel. So I will read from the English Standard Version, chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. And uh, next Sunday, we'll be finishing the chapter, chapter 8, 7, 18 to uh, the rest of the book, the chapter. This is the word of God, Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 17. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin to the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. 
For if you live according to the flesh, you will surely die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you do not, did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Amen and amen. This is the word of God. Uh, some time ago, I uh, met with a um, college kid who came back from college during the break and reported to me, Pastor Joseph, I, I asked him at first, you know, how was college life your first year and all that? And he went to a prestigious college, you know, far away from home. Pastor Joseph, so he said, I think I'm an admissions mistake. I don't belong there. <laughs> Everybody seems to be doing so well. You know, they're making good grades and keeping up with their homework and research and group teamwork projects. I'm suffering. I'm not sure if I can make it. So, um, you know, he was complaining about his situation. He's not sure if he is supposed to be there. He, in fact, is a, uh, you know, he thinks he is a admissions mistake. Does that happen, James, sometimes at your school too? No. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, if you go and ask his fellow friends at the same college, they say the same thing. <laughs> I think I'm a mistake, a glitch in the system. You know, they made a mistake and put my name instead of somebody else. You know, this happens in our life frequently, I'm not just talking about college, but as we move to a new place, as we try to fit into a new community, we have the fear Am I really going to fit in? Am I good enough? What will they think of me? How would I be presented to others? You know, and we, f we have this fear. When you go to a new school, new church, new job, or new location you move to, are the people around me like me, or am I not up to their level? And so we're always self-conscious. We're, we we're afraid. We're especially afraid of condemnation. What if... I make a stupid mistake, and my, I make a fool of myself. Would they make fun of me? How would I save face in a situation like that? That is the real fear that uh, we face in this world. When we go into a new situation, am I good enough? You've heard the term killed by a thousand stabs, right? Um, you know, we see people who unfortunately take their own lives, and as you roll back the film of their life, you find that it wasn't just one specific incident that led to that, but it was many, many words, maybe thoughtless words spoken by somebody, judgmental words, words of condemnation. Maybe it was a cold stare or glance that really hurt that person on and on and on, as if a thousand stabs were put on their hearts. And at the end, they come to this, uh, you know, un unthinkable um, conclusion of their life. Why are we afraid? Let's think about that a little bit. It's because you and I know that we make mistakes, right? You and I know that we are not perfect, and we are always liable. You know, there's a, a you know, a possibility that the I have committed something against the rules. You know, these days I see more and more restaurants are opening up and uh, people are dining outdoors and indoors even. I was at one last week with a friend. And uh, you frequently find the employ employer employees uh, yelling at people. <laughs> hey, there's too many people here. Get out, stand at the door. And you feel like so suddenly you're like, you know, um, intimidated. Have I done something wrong? Have I missed a little post that says how many people they're supposed to be in this room? Have I violated a regulation that they've imposed on us? And you're intimidated, you're afraid. Uh, last week as I was having lunch, when you have lunch indoors, and it's you know okay to have that these days, you have to take your mask off, right? But I felt so awkward taking off my mask. Is this legal? Am I gonna get in trouble if I take off the mask and eat? 
how would you eat with your mask on? <laughs> but there was this fear, this anxiety inside of me. Wow. And I think our time right now, we, everybody is a little bit uncertain about what's right and what's wrong. Am I going to be judged? Is somebody going to point fingers at me? And Where's that picture? <laughs> you know, um, we're afraid of judgment and condemnation. But our ultimate fear, I think, comes from not just people and regulation and rules that change all the time, but am I good enough for God? Would God see me and approve of me? Or is that a, a secret sin that I haven't even noticed that God will condemn me of and judge me uh, based of that? Yes, we're afraid of people's regulations and rules and all the laws. We're afraid of God's condemnation and law. It's not our intention to break the law, but it's like enslaving us. It's keeping us from living out a bold, a free, a you know, child of God kind of life. We are dwindled and are afraid, we want to hide and escape. What's the solution to this? How can we be free of, of such, you know, things that are placed upon our lives? Is, it, is the solution just, let's get rid of all the laws, you know, let's get rid of the regulation, let's tear, down, tear out the pieces, you know, the, the paper that says uh, 10 people and under, <laughs> or we can't have anarchy. That's not the solution. What is the solution? We want to go into that topic this morning. You know, I want to talk about the law of sin. Law of sin is like a policeman for our conscience. Law of sin is not a necessarily bad term, but it is the law, it is the rule of God that helps us determine what sin is. We can know what sin is, that we are in the wrong or right based upon the law of sin. It is a sort of guilty conscience that God has put in our hearts and in his word. How can we be free of the law of sin, though? How can we be free from that policeman of our conscience and have inner peace and inner confidence that God has given us already? How, to live, how can we live free from the law of sin is my question. I want to raise from this scripture that we read this morning. As always, or as usually, I uh, have two answers. I found two answers from the Word of God of how to be freed from the law of sin. First is this. Uh, you and I must believe in that Jesus freed us from condemnation. The fact that Jesus freed us from condemnation is the thing that he offers us to believe, and that's where it starts. Verse 1 and 2, look with me once again of chapter 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, and the con sentence continues on, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Whew, let me catch my breath there. So um, in the original Bible, I guess in your English Bible, there is a punctuation mark at the end of that sentence, right? It's one sentence, verse one and two. But if you were to put a punctuation mark, disregard what's already on there, what kind of punctuation would you put there? Is it like a, a question? For the law of sin of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death? Is that that kind of force is placed upon the sentence? Or is it a, a, a comma? Is it a passing thought? Is it a period? As we look at this sentence very carefully, Paul is making a real statement. He says, therefore, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. It deserves an exclamation point, don't you think? Paul is saying, you know, he's been struggling, chapter 7, there's this law inside of me. I'm a Christian now, and there's this law of God that I never had. But on the other hand, there's the law of sin that's now fighting against each other. What a wretched man I am. He's devastated. We, I use the analogy of that snake, the severed snake, remember? Even though the snake, snake's head is cut off, snake is still able to bite uh, up to two hours. We are still under the influence of sin. That sin, love sin is always tempting us uh, to sin, and we fall. We don't obey the word of God. And so in our hearts, there's this conflict. As a Christian, I still sin. Paul was the same. But after that struggle, the first thing that he says in chapter 1 is, there is no condemnation, exclamation point in Christ Jesus. So, 
if you are throwing something at somebody, what are you expecting from the other side? You're expecting them to receive it, right? Don't, don't just let it fall, right? You have to, you throw a ball and you catch it. Paul is throwing this amazing statement at us, and he's expecting us to catch it. And the word for catching in the spiritual world is the word believe, right? Accept, take it as a fact, because he said so. Let me read it one more time. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? For the law of the Spirit of life, the Holy Spirit, has set you free in Christ Jesus, again, from the law of sin and death. And that is a statement, non-arguable statement that God has done. So he's demanding, he's expecting us to receive in faith. And he goes in further, how was this possible? How is it that those who are in Christ Jesus is not condemned? There's no condemnation or judgment or fear anymore, but there's life. There is hope. Why is that? Verse 3, it's the concept that we know so very well about. Why is Paul emphasizing it again? I'll read it and then we'll explain. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. We wanted to we couldn't. We know what's right, but we don't do it because law of sin. Sinful nature, that snake bite is always there. By sending his own son in the likeness of the sinful flesh and for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh. Saying, you were weak. We could not do it, but God, the great contrast, but God sent his own son in the flesh. What do we call that? We call that the incarnation, right? We should have received the condemnation. We should have been judged. We should have got the punishment for our sins, but God made Jesus like us in the flesh so that he could take the punishment. He could take the condemnation. He can take the judgment, right? That's what it's saying. And then verse not 4, in order that the righteous requirement uh, of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So that now, all the condemnation and judgment is on him. He fulfilled, he's paid the price for judgment, our judgment. And so, because all the, the judgment is met, the requirement is met, you and I, there is no more things due. Paid in full. And what is Paul saying? Believe. <laughs> he's, again, proclaiming that fact that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The first fact that we need to receive in faith in order to be free from the law of sin is this very fact that Jesus freed us, Jesus freed us from condemnation. Amen? And God sacrificed his son for this to happen. Let me explain this in a more easier, simple term. I know chapter 8 can be a little bit complicated, so I'll, I'll try as much as possible to make it easy for us as possible. I've read this many times to understand it myself. It's like this. You know, you and I, in order to avoid the fear and condemnation of this world, we focus on our performance. Hey, if I'm good enough with the rules, if I am pretty enough, if I'm smart enough, if I have enough the means, you know, money, capitalism, right? If I have enough money, I'll be accepted. I'll be okay. I'll be even praised. If we focus our attention on our performance, there's always fear. There's always a bigger fish, right? There's always somebody that outperforms you. There's always a mistake that will happen in your life. And you and I will be condemned eventually by the world, the laws of the world. But what Paul is saying is, don't fix your thoughts on the performance of yourself, but fix your thoughts on the performance of God, what God has done. Remember what God has done. He has, again, sent his son incarnate on this earth with flesh to be just like one of us. And he took the blow. He took the pain. He took the judgment and condemnation for us. So as we focus on the love of God the Father that sent the son, as we focus on Jesus who died in our place on the cross, as we focus on the Holy Spirit who raised this Jesus from the dead, the resurrection, we can have a true confidence in our freedom 
in Christ. You know, I think uh, I was reminded of a past century missionary pastor that worked in India. Thank you for praying for the India people right now. Um, they need our prayers and they need our love. Thank you for praying for people over there. Uh, India, uh, a missionary to India called uh, Dr. Stanley Jones. Uh, and uh, he lived then, like centuries, last century. Uh, and uh, he was called like the Billy Graham of India back in the day. And as he was uh, doing field ministry, uh, he taught and preached to people, and he observed something about faith and fear. And listen carefully to what he said on faith and fear. He says, I'm inwardly fashioned for faith. He's looking at it in inside, inwardly. I'm inwardly fashioned for faith, not for fear. Fear is not native land for me. Faith is. I am so made that worry and anxiety are like sand in the machinery of life. Faith is the oil. I live better by faith and confidence than by fear, doubt, and anxiety. In an anxiety and worry, my being is gasping for breath. These are not my native air. But in faith, he says, and confidence, I breathe freely. These are my native air. And he goes on and quotes a Johns Hopkins doctor. Uh, a Johns Hopkins University doctor says, we do not know why it is that warriors, you know, like people who worry, not warriors, <laughs> warriors die sooner than the non-warriors. Doesn't know. But it is a fact, this doctor says. And uh, Dr. Jones goes on and says, but I who am simple of mind think I know. We are inwardly constructed in nerve and tissue, brain cell and soul for faith, not for fear. God made us that way. To live by worry is to live against who we are. Amen. I can say amen to that. In order for us to live liberated life from the anxiety of life and the condemnation of others, you and I, must believe what God said about us, what Jesus has done for us, that there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus for those who believe in him. It is to believe. You could proclaim to yourself every morning, you know, regardless how the world might see me, I am a daughter of God. I am a son of God. Get away from me, Satan. And sometimes a fear comes like a tsunami to us, like for me too. In the morning, in the evening, what if? A lot of what ifs, you know? After pandemic, what if my job? What if my family? What if my finances? What if my future? What if my marriage, my kids? All this tsunami comes, but you proclaim, I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. There is no condemnation. There is no fear because of who I am, what God has done for me. As we proclaim what Paul proclaimed and believe it in our hearts, we can truly stand, stand still, stand firm in the many fears of every day. I believe uh, one act of faith that you and I can pr pr uh, practice this week, as you probably do already, is to worship God. Worship God not only here, but in your daily life. Be it five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour. Worshiping in the original word is proskuneo, and we get the word prostrate, to fall down from that word proskuneo. Worship literally means to fall down before God, face down on the ground. It is an act of submission. It is an act of receiving. It is an act of helplessness. God, I need you more than anything. It is an act of like Mary, you know, Mother Jesus, when she said, I am your servant girl, let your world, word be done in my life. It is like Samuel the prophet when he was young. God, speak to me, I will listen. It is that submissive attitude of our heart. It is worship. And as we submit to our Lord Jesus every day in our hearts and through our worship, guess what? We don't have to submit to fear. Amen. Jesus has overcome fear, even death, and all the suffering. We need, to we need to fear God and submit to him. 
and trust that he has freed us. Jesus has freed us from condemnation. Now, Paul is very, I like Paul because he's, he's an action kind of, guy, kind of guy. So we have to believe first here and proclaim to ourselves through worship every day, reminding ourselves what God has done for us, you and me, that there is no condemnation. Nobody can dare judge us because God has said we are righteous in Christ. Amen? But Paul goes on further in verse 12 and on. And he gives us something, an action plan. Uh, the second reason, in fact, and then he gives an action plan how to uh, defeat the fear and condemnation in our lives. Verse 12, so then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh. We're dead to sin and flesh. To live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And verse 14 is the key verse for today for all who are led by the spirit of god are sons of god you know we uh, before we believe in jesus we there was fear there's anxiety and that we lived according to the flesh you know somebody says you're bad you're wrong and we are affected by it we believe it and you have well, low self-esteem all of us do from early on our young lives we have been affected and impacted by the sin. And the Bible calls, Paul says that we were the slaves of sin. But Paul wants us to remember one thing. Verse 14, going back to verse 14, that verse that uh, sums up this message. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. One distinction that we have from everybody else as a Christian is that we have the Spirit of God. You see, Christianity and our faith is not just like self-help, you know, just, you know, talking to yourself and I am positive, I am, you know, better than everybody else and I can make it. Is it uh, make it until you fake it or something? Fake it until you make it, right? <laughs> you know, you, you could listen to all those kind of things, but that's not what Christianity is. The distinction of Christianity is that there is a person that is our helper, the Holy Spirit. We don't seek self-help, but we seek spirit help. Amen? The Spirit of God is the one that brings true boldness and confidence and acceptance from God. Just like you can manage your health as best as you can by eating right and exercising, but it's nothing compared to having a personal doctor who knows every, uh, you know, every weakness of your body, having a personal coach, fitness coach, who, who sees what you can be, what your body can be, and being trained by them. Like so, the Holy Spirit is a spirit that dwells in us, and he's the coach, the helper. Jesus calls him the helper, the helps, and is, come, is alongside us, parakletos, you know, alongside like a friend. He's supporting and encouraging. You can do it. So I want to ask this question, how does the Holy Spirit help us to live a free, condemnation-free life, to live the life of the child of God. He does many things, but one thing that, bring, that is clearly shown from the scripture this morning in chapter 8 is that he does it by giving us a true spiritual identity. He gives us a badge and tells us who we are. Going back to this beautiful verse that we read, in verse uh, 14, for all, uh, 15 rather, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery. Yes, we had a badge before that the world gave us. Oh, you are a project manager, you are a team member, you are a CEO, you are a mom, you're, well, that's not the world, the world gave us. But you are, you know, a worker, employee, or employer, teacher, whatever, doctor. There was this name tag, badge, we had in the world. But it says, we, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received the spirit of uh, adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The, the name tag that we held in the world, it was a good one. It still is a good one. It gives you money, right? But there's a fear attached to this badge. What if this name tag is taken away from you? What if you get laid off? What if there's a person that is in front of you that has a higher, a bigger, you know, a bossier kind of name tag before them? Are you going to be afraid of them? 
you know, intimidated by them. This is the badge of slavery to the world. But the Spirit has given us a new badge, and this badge is the badge that says, Son of God, Daughter of God. And in fact, look at what, how uh, Holy Spirit describes God our Father as adoption as sons or daughters by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Have we seen this somewhere, Abba, Father? We sing about it and, you know, you've seen it somewhere. Yes, you have. You've seen it in Jesus' lips. When he prayed to God, he said, Abba, Father, let your will be done, not mine. We saw Jesus on Jesus' lips when he cried out to Abba, Father on the cross. It was a term reserved for Jesus and God the Father's relationship. We could not dare call him 